Michael Murray from Franklin and Marshall College. His paper is entitled Vindicato Die, Evil as a Result of God's Free Choice of the Best. Thank you. Uh, we, um, we're starting a little late, but we are going to end very close to on time. Uh, so all, we're all the more compressed here. Um, I want to join the, the chorus of others in uh, thanking Sam and Mike for their organizing work and, uh, uh, and the Templeton Foundation as well, although I think I mean something more by that than all of you might. Um, I just want to say a brief word about the foundation, I suppose since I'm, I'm the, uh, the representative here at the conference and uh, some of you might know about its work and some of you might not. But uh, the foundation is primarily dedicated to uh, two kinds of activity uh, based on the, the, the wishes of the uh, founder. And the first is to try to uh, support research that allows a greater understanding of divinity. And by that, Sir John Templeton might mean something probably different from what you might mean if you were to utter the same words. Uh, it's not often uh, talked about, and you certainly can't find evidence of this on the, on the foundation's website, but as best I can tell, uh, Sir John Templeton was a pantheist, and that actually explains the, uh, the, what looks like incoherent pair of interests on, in science on the one hand and in philosophy and theology on the other hand. He really saw these as, uh, as not, not wholly distinct activities. Um, my, my job there has been to try to develop the philosophy and theology side of the portfolio by funding projects like this one and others. Uh, and many of you are involved in uh, various kinds of research that intersect with the foundation's interests. And uh, so you should tell me about those, or you should uh, have a look at the website and put in an application for funding, because we're looking for uh, good projects to fund. The other part of the uh, foundation's interests really is to support work and activity aimed at uh, increasing um, love, generosity, gratitude, and humility, amongst other things. And uh, there are a variety of projects we fund, both with respect to research on issues like character development and uh, to some extent ethics, although that's a tricky territory for us. And um, if you have uh, interest in projects along those lines, uh, we'd certainly be interested in hearing about those. Um, when I was listening to uh, Christia give her talk at the early part, she said, well, I'm going to talk about this uh, uh, topic, which as many of you know, I've written about ad nauseum, and I thought, yeah, that's me too. Uh, a lot of what's going to go on in this talk is uh, uh, concerns an issue that I've talked about for a long time. Uh, I'm still talking about it mostly because I haven't succeeded in convincing anybody as far as I can tell. And, um, and it's convincing people that Leibniz held this view that probably doesn't work. So um, here's my next attempt at trying to uh, talk to you about a view that probably doesn't work but nobody thinks Leibniz holds it anyway. Um, so this paper is very, very, very long, and as you might guess, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to skip over parts of it, and in fact, 10 minutes ago, I decided I was going to read a different part of it than I intended to read uh, before, so, uh, but it won't have any impact on Lloyd's uh, comments in particular. So here we go. Um, in one sense, Leibniz's theodicy is painlessly simple. Despite the evil contained in the actual world, God's justice is vindicated because permitting that evil was a necessary condition for securing the best possible world. And I'm tempted to say, that's it. And then I was going to walk down and sit down in my chair. But uh, of course, we all know that it's, it's more complicated than that. Uh, part of the reason it isn't as painlessly simple as that is because that solution requires some corollaries that aren't painless or simple. And in this paper, I want to look closely at one of these corollaries, namely that freely choosing to actualize the best world is indeed possible for God. And this is a theme that's come up in a number of different papers and in the Q&A as well. Um, for it's easy to see, for us and for Leibniz, that this theodician scheme faces looming necessitarian pressures. The pressure comes primarily from two directions, and this isn't news to anybody. First of all, the first uh, from his concept containment account of truth which appears to lead to a necessitarianism according to which every property had by a substance is had by that substance essentially. And we've heard a number of passages supporting that um, over the course of the conference. The second arises from his theological commitments concerning creation, which appear to lead to a necessitarianism according to which the actual world's the only possible world. 
In both cases, he resisted the pressure publicly and mightily, I think. In the Theodicy, for example, Leibniz addressed the second theological concern, the concern I'll address in this paper, in stark terms. There he relies on the pointed words of Bale to raise the challenge for himself. And I really like this quote as a way of laying out the problem. I've heard other people refer to it, but the means most appropriate for attaining an end is of necessity one alone. Therefore, if God is prompted irresistibly to employ this means, he employed it by necessity. Therefore, he could only do that which he did. Therefore, that which has not happened or will never happen is absolutely impossible. Therefore, Adam's perseverance and innocent was always impossible. Therefore, his fall was altogether inevitable and even antecedently to God's decrees, for it implies a contradiction that God should be able to will a thing opposed to his wisdom. It is, after all, the same thing to say that it's impossible for God as to say God could do it if he willed, but he cannot will it, which for those who are inclined to conditional analyses of compatibilism is a sort of, there you are, gotcha. Um, anyway, how did Leibniz resist the necessitarian pressures arising from the claim that God cannot fail to choose the best? As anyone in this audience surely knows, this is a contentious question. It's generally held that two options are available, each of which Leibniz endorsed, endorsed at one time or another. The two options become evident when we consider the simple argument that leads to Leibniz's troubles. And the argument goes like this. Uh, necessarily, God wills the best. Necessarily, there's one world which is best, namely our world. So necessarily, our world exists. To avoid the argument, an argument which we might call the theological necessity argument, Leibniz must deny the first or second premise. Um, most commentators agree or presuppose in what they say that when he rejects the first, he makes appeal to his possible in its own nature account of freedom or contingency, according to which an outcome of choice is possible for an agent when the intrinsic properties of that object of choice are compossible. That's one way of putting it. When operating this way, Leibniz is thinking that there are alternative possible worlds which are less than optimal and which meet this condition of intrinsic coherence and that as a result such worlds are genuinely possible objects of choice for God. Since these suboptimal worlds are possibly choosable by God, it can't be a necessary truth that God chooses the best world and so premise one is false. Um, further, most commentators agree that when he rejects the second, he's relying on his infinite analysis account of contingency. When thinking this way, Leibniz is arguing that since it's not finitely demonstrable that this world is best, the truth of this claim is contingent. But I claim there's this third solution offered by Leibniz, which is usually ignored or just taken to be subterfuge or confusion on Leibniz's part. And you find it in a number of places, especially in the Theodicy. And here's one passage that I cite in the paper that uh, sets forth this solution. The decree to create is free, but it doesn't compel God. There is therefore in God a freedom that is exempt not only from constraint but also from necessity. I mean this in respect of metaphysical necessity, for it's a moral necessity that the wisest should be bound to choose the best. Uh, in these and similar passages, Leibniz seems to be arguing against premise one, but in a different way. Uh, he seems to concede that God's choice of the best is necessary, but not in a way that undercuts freedom. So the question naturally arises, what is this moral necessity? How does it differ from the dreaded metaphysical necessity? And can the distinction rescue Leibniz from the apparent necessitarian implications of his view? Um, let me be clear that when Leibniz invokes this third solution, uh, he does, as he does in the passages I have in the paper, including the one I cited, um, he often does it in a way that runs in harness with these others, possible in its own nature, defense, and the infinite analysis they appear sometimes side by side. And that, I think, has led a lot of people to think, well, you know, the, the heavy lifting's really being done by those other accounts, and this other thing is just obfuscation, and uh, we don't, it's, just, it's just dead weight. It's not really doing any work. Um, and that's the part that I think is mistaken. Instead, on my view, by endorsing the position that God's morally necessitated to create the best, he was aligning himself with an important minority theological position on the topic that would have been well known to all of his readers. My claim that is in his maturity, he saw the views uh, he'd been favoring since the mid-80s as, as in full accord with this minority position, and he employed the terminology because he was intentionally aligning himself with that view. And by the way, this seems to be a view that uh, De Boss shared in the, and, and uh, set forth in the uh, opening, the preface uh, to his translation of the Theodicy. Um, 
he employed this terminology because he was uh, aligning himself with this view and in the later years, I think, appeals to infinite analysis or possible in its own nature of view were just aimed at supplementing or filling out the view. So I think it actually becomes primary for him. Uh, to make good on this interpretation would require two things. First of all, that I go back and, and explain what this tradition is and, and how it develops and uh, what the views were that I'm claiming he was well acquainted with. And then the second part is showing, uh, the second paper would be showing how uh, Leibniz actually uh, endorses this view and why he endorses it, uh, uh, where he learned it from. I, I can't do that second part. I, I, I don't have a clue. I've been looking. I can't find uh, the, the smoking gun. I can't find the missing text. Um, but what I can do is go back and show you the, the historical antecedents and um, then I'll let you draw your own conclusion about just how closely aligned his views are with this, uh, with this older view. So the next part of the paper goes on in, uh, in some detail about uh, St. Thomas's view because most of the commentators that I claim he picks up on are commenting on St. Thomas and trying to develop his views. And um, I guess at this point all I'll do is summarize that section of the paper with this slide. Uh, Thomas deflected the necessitarian worries springing from his views in two quite different ways. Uh, first, given the nature of God, divine love, and the divine will, these are three distinct sorts of arguments he makes. God could not be necessitated in creating, even if there were a best. But two, one's irrelevant because there is no best world. Um, that's the summary of that part of the paper that I skipped. Okay, so now um, we'll jump forward, and what I want to do is look at some of the works of these people that I whose um, thought I've been uh, describing in other papers. But here the focus is on uh, moral necessity with respect to God's creation of the best. That's not an area that I have explored much in the past, and that's what I want to look at now. So in the early 17th century, um, so I'll, I, but I need to go back a little bit and talk. The origin of the view actually comes from deploying moral necessity in the context of thinking about human freedom and issues about predestination and election. That's where it gets started. And then the, they think this insight is very valuable in solving other theological problems. So I would just want to back up to that beginning part. Then we'll talk about the application. So in the early 17th century, the most contentious theological topic. Now, whatever I say next, you know, has to be controversial, right? But this is actually the way I see it. Concern the um, connection between providence, election, and human freedom. It's impossible to trace out the terrain with any clarity and accuracy in this paper. So it'll have to suffice to say that the majority of the disputants, pro Protestant and Roman Catholic, fell into one of two camps, roughly speaking. On one side of the dispute were those who wanted to emphasize divine sovereignty and omnipotence at the expense of human freedom. Now, they wouldn't put it that way. Right? That's the way their critics might put it. Um, they argued that uh, divine providence and election was effected by direct divine activity on created substances. I think I jumped ahead too quick there. Uh, and that God's causal contributions were intrinsically efficacious in bringing about the result God intended for them. On the other side of the dispute were those who believed that God's providential activity uh, was carried out by way of causal activity which was efficacious only conditionally, that is, only when it met with proper voluntary cooperation on the part of the creature. In Protestant circles, those in the former category were said to defend the view that divine providence was carried out by way of absolute decrees. And you see Leibniz talking about absolute decrees. It's a, it's a significant topic in this period in Protestant theology, while those in the latter category were said to, to defend the view, defend the reality of conditional decrees. That's the way providence is carried out. Uh, on the latter view, providence and election were carried forth in virtue of God's conditional knowledge of what creatures would do when confronted with divine causal cooperation of one sort of another, or another. So it will be useful to stick some labels on defenders of these views, so we'll call them absolutists and uh, conditionalists. Conditionalists leveled two powerful charges against absolutists. First, absolutism was inconsistent with human freedom, and second, they had no way of reconciling divine goodness with the reality of evil. If everything happened in virtue of God's deploying this intrinsically efficacious grace, if anybody was doing evil, it was entirely God's responsibility, and that, that's a problem. Um, absolutists level, level equally serious challenges. First, there's no way for God to have the sort of knowledge conditionalists claimed was necessary to exercise this sort of providence. And for those of you who are interested in contemporary issues in philosophy of religion, you know this exact same issue is front and center in disputes about providence and contemporary philosophy in light of creatures having that kind of freedom. Avoiding these charges would require invoking a variety of necessitation in creaturely freedom. They were willing to concede that. 